I want to welcome our audience to this Learn podcast. It is in these podcasts that Learn wants you to meet experts that can help you in your work as school leaders or perhaps partners in the education landscape. The topic for this podcast is indoor environment quality, and our guest is Jim Trafficant, Chairman of Citadel Sciences. On the Learn website, you will find on the research page under the COE of Health and the Element of Indoor Environment Quality, research in this area being discussed today, along with potential resources to access. Jim, I want to welcome you to the Learn Podcast. It's really good to have you here today to speak with us about this important topic. Now, I know you have an extensive research and work background in the area of indoor environment quality with a 30-year-plus career in science and engineering in healthcare and aerospace industry. You've done significant work in helping organizations transform their work, and more recently, in the area of air quality. Would you please share with the audience some of that background and experience um, that leads to your expertise in this area? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, David, thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for your leadership with LEARN and your lifetime of service and education. Uh, you're one of the pioneering uh, thought leaders in education, and it's an honor for me to be here today. So I really appreciate thank it. You. My background is, as you mentioned, is in aerospace and uh, healthcare and technology um, uh, and a lot in the science and transformation of industries across all those domains. Um, the idea of clean air for schools, when you think about uh, the future of education, one of the things that we know clearly is that uh, building design and clean air are foundational to the learning experience. There's all kinds of science behind this. A lot of the, my background and the reason we made this um, pivot, if you will, into education and particularly clean air comes from my experience at the White House. Um, post 9-11, I had the contracts to modernize the Situation Room at the White House and also Air Force One. Um, if you remember, if you saw like the 20th anniversary of 9-11 on, uh, uh, on Apple, they noted that the president wasn't connected. We didn't have good continuity and communications. So that modernization um, was to protect continuity of government and those that were serving. Uh, 45 days after 9-11, um, we had a, an anthrax threat. And because we put a layered approach in, technically, um, as I mentioned, I had the Situation Room and Air Force One, so we had constant connectivity to the leadership. And then I had clinical partners that also took uh, preemptive action and a layered approach to protect the health and well-being of those that were serving. When the anthrax threat hit, we were able to uh, protect those that were um, in government and the function of government uh, in a way that really helped inform what we're bringing to education. And it's a layered approach to clean air um, to help our students and teachers perform at their best. Yeah, and, and that's an amazing background and experience. And I love the concept, Jen, that you shared about layered approaching. I think too often than not in education, we tend to look at kind of one shot uh, approaches to things and we don't think about the, those kind of layered pieces. And right. and uh, I know you've done since you pivoted from that work, and I, you're probably still engaged in that work. You're just not going to tell us about it. But uh, <laughs> since you uh, have pivoted towards schools, you spent a lot of time in researching around air, indoor air yeah. quality and how it affects schools and whatnot. We can't share all of that in the length of time we have for this podcast, but would you share with our audience some key insights or information about the research that's out there specifically focused in air quality? Imagine being an Olympic athlete and you're training and you're going to compete against the rest of the world. You're being tested physically and mentally uh, and you have to perform at your best. But then you find out you're being constrained in terms of your access to oxygen. Like it's obvious that you couldn't be at peak performance. And if that's true for athletes, it's also true for students and teachers. And we've known for years that clean air enhances test scores, improves average daily attendance, lowers the dropout rate significantly improves teacher performance and retention, and even lowers the cost of operating a school. And yet, while all this information has been known previously, the pandemic really magnified the impact. Um, and yet very little has been done to date to remedy this, and it's very simple and cost-effective to do so. Um, there is a, a national assessment of education progress. This is um, the nation's report card, and it showed how uh, test scores were dropping. We've done our own research, and we see that one of the key concerns for teachers and parents is learning loss due to the pandemic. We've seen the test scores drop, uh, setting the benchmark, if you will, back 20 years where, you know, 
37% of fourth graders and 30% of eighth graders cannot even reach the basic score. We're seeing all these consequences of the learning environment um, coming into education. And there's a whole lot of research that shows um, we could really do something uh, materially to change the course and the direction of the educational environment. The other thing that became evident um, over the last couple of years is not only significant learning loss, but those that were in underserved schools suffered the most. The, the students from a high poverty uh, environment experienced three times as much learning loss in reading compared to those um, that were in a better setting. And so this, this idea that clean air can be the great equalizer and can really make a difference in um, performance, both for students and teachers, um, is known and scientifically validated. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, the Harvard School of Public Health talks about cognition being able to increase by 60 to over 100% just by having better clean air. Um, another study found that students in cl classrooms with better air scored 14 to 15% 15 higher on standard test scores. We know that um, uh, the EPA says that good physical condition, uh, good air quality can improve teacher retention. And all of these things are, are fairly simplistic. One of the first things you assume when you think about putting a layered approach to clean air into a facility is, well, our school can't afford that. And David, you had done this when you were superintendent at Mesquite. It literally boils down to about the price of a textbook to have clean air available for your students and enable to create an environment where learning and uh, students and teachers can be at their best. So this is, this is very affordable and the science behind it is very compelling. Right, and what struck me as I did this work was the, the maintenance cost was almost nothing. That You're Correct. used to things having a high maintenance cost to them. It was remarkably low um, to the point where it wasn't a concern. And for the seven to 10 year lifetime on your, your initial implementation, it's really a, a great, Great outcome. Now, it's interesting to me, though, you you point out a lot of low hanging fruit. And I, I'm just curious, as a follow up question, the the timeline from the point where a district decides they want to go about doing this work and actually being able to get all the, the systems in place to, to clean that air. It's pretty short, isn't it? Oh, it's really short. It's weeks. This is yeah. not this is not um, rocket science. You know, I've worked in the in the aerospace industry. This is not it. They're very um, proven technologies, very affordable. And the thing that I love about this layered approach um, and the models that the science gives evidence to um, efficacy and even cost benefit, as well as performance, all the things that we just highlighted, um, it's very accessible. Mm -hmm. This is um, simple to install, low maintenance requirement. In fact, low to no maintenance over a 10 year period. Um, this is all due to, uh, and, you, and your cost of it, the ROI is within the first two years with an eight year tail that all that money that you were putting out into energy for inefficiency, for, for poor air quality, you actually get clean air, better performance, and that money that you were spending on energy now comes back into your uh, classrooms. Well, you you kind of answered my next question, but I'm going to give you a chance just to, uh, you know, sure add a little if you want to, but it's like, Anytime you want to implement something new into a district that people are not used to, one of the things you want to be able to do is communicate to your internal and external community some of those predictable positive outcomes, like out of the gate before we even do it. These are some predictable positives. If you were talking to a district, what would be maybe three of those things you would you know, you know, accentuate, if you will, for their audiences? Yeah. And a couple, one other thing I want to add to this uh, layered model um, as part of this answer is... It's one thing to say that it works. And when I was in the space community, we would take the complexity of networks of spacecraft, like the GPS satellites, and we would distill it down so we could have uh, a very simplistic interface and you would know situational awareness of what's going on in space. We would even do health and safety of spacecraft. And we, we have sensors as part of the layered approach. So you could see the efficacy of this solution and show it to your parents, show it to your board, show it to your teachers. In fact, um, the NEA cited that there are 600,000 fewer teachers in education 
And of the 10 million that are left, over half of those are looking to leave sooner than they would have otherwise. And 70% of the teachers that are working believe that they, the air environment, the internal environment of those schools does not protect their health. Those, those are the facts. What we could do about it is we know that with clean air, you get improved average daily attendance, better student performance. And better student performance, like the EPA has cited, you need clean air and clear messaging. And, uh, and part of that clear messaging is it's like five students per thousand improvement in ADA, wow. a, a lowering and an improvement of 13 students per thousand in lowering the dropout rate. Um, teacher retention goes up, health of the student and staff improves, lower absenteeism. And one of the things you, we're seeing, we've never, this is an unprecedented time for absenteeism, chronic absenteeism. In Detroit Public Schools, they were over 76% last year, chronic absenteeism. Even in wealthy states, they face a huge problem. California was looking at uh, 30% chronic absenteeism when it was 12% before the pandemic. People are just unsure of the environment and clean air, the NEA, the EPA, FDA, all these groups have cited, if you clean up the air at a school, you're gonna get students coming back, better performance, teacher retention, and better results. That's why we're in this discipline. That's why we've pivoted to um, help make a difference and equip the next generation for all the advantages that America offers. Um, and clean air is gonna be foundational to the future of schools, which I, I love what you're doing with LEARN. Wow. Uh, the, those are some really keen insights. Thank you, Jim. Now you have some experience in this area. And so you know that for all those positive things, there are some implementation barriers. If a district wanted to do this, what are the things they most need to think about in terms of overcoming those potential implementation barriers? Yeah, I think one of the things the EPA cites is, is it's very important. If you're going to have clean air, you need to have clear messaging. And so I think being able to communicate with staff with students, with parents, with the board about what these advantages are and the steps, the preemptive measures that you're gonna to take to create a learning environment conducive to all the benefits that we just described is probably one of, the, one of the ways to mitigate any impediments or concerns that somebody might have with taking these steps. From a technical standpoint, honestly, it's fairly simple to put this in. As we mentioned, this is weeks, it's very affordable um, and the results are very compelling. Yeah, Jim, I, my district, I, I think we had 50, no, 70 plus buildings. Right. And within a matter of about six to eight weeks, every building was was uh, uh, fixed with the indoor air quality systems that we were using. So, yeah, it doesn't take very much to do. It was surprisingly easy. It's just a little time consuming. But other than that, it was surprisingly easy. And Dave, one of the things you mentioned, uh, I remember having this conversation, was that when you finished, not only did you have clean air, but the mold and the mildew and places, you know, you had a benefit that went beyond what you even expected. And the yeah. board put out a press release uh, from Mesquite after you did this, citing that it was $20 a student to have that uh, work done, the cost of a textbook. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really inexpensive. And, and especially from a long-term standpoint, really inexpensive. Right. Now, can you share with the audience how this work has impacted some schools that you've worked with and some of the stories you've experienced around this? Yeah, you know, I'm going to give you one, which was uh, super interesting. This was, uh, there was a K through eight school and that fed into a high school. Uh, and this is in Virginia. And uh, the, the head of the school uh, in the high school wanted this. So we went and put in uh, the layered approach. And this layered approach includes things like needlepoint bipolar ionization. One of the things I love about the layered approach, as you mentioned, there's no silver bullet to um, creating clean air. And, and I would do an analogy here. You know, when you jump into a swimming pool at a school, it's not like we just, in order to clean the water in the pool, we don't just have a hose running fresh water into the pool. That's expensive. It's not practical. What we do is treat it so that that water is safe and, uh, environmentally friendly and all of those things. That's, that's how we treat it. We can do the same thing with the air. And bipolar ionization cleans the air while we're talking. It's mitigating pathogens and airborne risks. And while we're together, not waiting for it just to be filtered, that's one of the layers, but while we're talking. So they put the bipolar ionization in, we've um, 
use other things to clean the air. There's a technology called a troffer. It, it circulates the air, cleans it with UV light, creates airflow where you may have um, not great airflow. And then we also have sensors. The high school that put this in didn't have to stop during COVID last year, not, didn't have to stop at all. Some of the, the feeder school, the K through eight, chose not to put it in and had to stop uh, school multiple times. In fact, some of the kids were in the same families that were in the you know K through eight versus a high school, and yet the high school never had to shut down. The wow. efficacy of this is is really self evident, and again, very affordable. So, I think what's going to happen over time, we think about the future of school the kind of work that Learn is doing. At, at the moment, this feels like a, a luxury. Like, boy, you know, clean air. Nobody's banging on my door to make this a necessity because people don't really know about it. But I am confident that the future of education is going to have clean air as one of the foundational components in the learning environment because the results are so compelling and the price is so affordable. Yeah, I would agree with that. Now, if there was a district that's interested in this work and wanted to work with you, what district would you encourage them to go look at right now? Um, Mesquite would be one. Uh, you know, where you've, you've put the bipolar ionization in. And this technology is used all around the country. The sensors are in, uh, for example, the Denver Public Schools, a lot of schools here in Virginia, the Atlanta Public Schools, some in Chicago. Troffers are used in Atlanta, the D.C. Public Schools. Those are places where you could check. Bipolar ionization, there's 150,000 implementations of this. It's used in um, even places like uh, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo, um, where you've got fragile populations and they know that clean air is part of health. And so they put this technology in to help mitigate pathogens and improve the well-being of not only those that are in a healing environment, but those that are giving care. Mm -hmm. So when you think about teachers and the need to uh, improve retention, when you think about enabling our, our students and staff to perform at their best, clean air is going to be foundational. So I would say reach out to Citadel. Um, there's you know, school districts across the country that are using these technologies and we can get you connected. Well, Jim, and if a district partner did want to reach out with you, how would they go about contacting you and arranging for a deeper conversation? Yeah, you could go to citadelsciences.com or else you could come through Learn and, and get connected that way with all the research and they would be happy to you know, direct you to us. And uh, I would be I would you know, welcome those conversations. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jim, for being a part of the important work of supporting our students in schools. And thank you for your participation in this Learn podcast. Yeah, David, thank you for leading us. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Absolutely.